Greetings, brethren. Welcome to the Feast of Trumpets 2019. And another year has come around, and it's a tremendous thing that God is doing. And it's going to be greater and bigger and more spectacular than we have ever understood. The great day, the great day of the Lord. And yet, when you read the account in Leviticus 23, where we're commanded to keep the Feast of Trumpets, let's turn there. It's a very small explanation. Now, why is that? Because the rest of the Bible fills in the blanks. So let's come to verse 23, Leviticus 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of ram's horns, a holy convocation. Look at that. And no servile work is to be done. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you know, we always take up an offering with the holy days. And today is a special day. So when we take up the offering, please keep that in mind. And remember, one of the obligations that we have is to warn the world. Now, there are many other people warning the world about other different things, which is good and true and ought to be. But what we need to do is project the gospel, the truth of God, and the righteousness of his return. So at this time, we'll take a short pause, and we will take up an offering. Now let's begin by going to Matthew 24, so we can come up to the, the right point and understand what's going to happen. Now we know at the end time, Daniel 7 tells us that there will be a covenant made with the people and there will be a prince and that prince will be awesome and great. We'll see that in just a little bit. But when you come to Matthew 24, nearly every one of the things leading up to verse 15, are in cycles. There are wars, rumors of war, there are false prophets, there are all of those things taking place. But there is one singular event. And remember when Jesus was speaking to the disciples, they were looking at the temple. And they were asking, when's your return and what is the sign of your coming? And he said, you see all of these beautiful buildings? There shall not be one stone left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that literally happened. However, when we come to verse 15, we find something that's very unusual. Because we know the temple was destroyed. We know that not one stone was left upon another, and yet here we have something that involves the temple. So this means there must be an end time temple built. And so when that is built, and we know by Revelation 11, that John was told to measure the temple well, John didn't quite understand when he compared that with Matthew 24. Because when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, there was no abomination of desolation that stood in the holy place. So when he was told by God to write to measure the temple and then Shortly after that, the two witnesses come on the scene. 
So let's pick it up here in Matthew 24 and verse 15. Therefore, when you shall see the abomination of desolation which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Now, there has to be the temple. It doesn't say standing on holy ground but standing in the holy place, the holy of holies. So John, not understanding how that could be, when he wrote the book of Revelation, and we'll go back there in just a little bit, he wrote this parenthetical statement. The one who reads, let him understand. Now Jesus did not speak those words. John put those in there under inspiration. And then let those in Judea flee, etc., etc., and come on down here. Come on down here to verse 20. And pray that your flight be not in the winter, nor on the Sabbath. A little sidebar. Here shows that the Sabbath was being kept at the end times. All right? Verse 21, For then there shall be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world. Awful, horrible, calamitous, of great magnitude of destruction, that's coming on the world. Until that time, nor ever shall be again. And if those days were not limited, now that's what it means, not cut short. Three and a half years is the limit. And as we have seen, the tribulation against Israel is two years. And then at the beginning of the third year, which means there's about a year and a half left. He raises up Israel. Now we'll go to that in just a bit. But let's see what's going to happen here when the temple is built. Okay. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or he is there, do not believe it. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, many of them, more than we have ever understood. And they shall present great signs and wonders. Now what happens when great signs and wonders take place? People see it. They, believed what they believe then what they are told in order to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I foretold it to you. Therefore, if they shall say to you, come and see, he's in the wilderness, don't go forth. Come and see, he's in the secret chambers. Do not believe it. Because what God is going to do is going to be spectacular and open and known to the whole world. There will not be one person who will not know the events that are taking place. No one's going to escape. It says even the islands in the ocean are going to be removed. No place to go. So don't believe it. Now then, we covered this already. The sign of the Son of Man. Okay? Verse 27. Here's a description of it. For as the light of day which comes forth from the east and shines as far as the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now that's something to understand. It's going to be visible. It's going to be known. And the whole world's going to understand it. 
Verse 28, but he immediately after the day, tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give its light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then he says, going to send the angels out for the first resurrection. Now, let's come to Revelation 13. We've seen what's going to come. Let's see what takes place before that. Let's see how the whole world is deceived and goes after the beast in a tremendous and fantastic way. And that the bringing of all the religions together. Now, there's a lot of background work that's going on. In the past, I have said, well, maybe when they had the, the second Vatican Council, where they agreed on ecumenism, that that's when the first seal was open. I will have to say that's probably not correct. But that is background work leading up to the time when all religions will agree. So that's just preparing the way. Now we know in Revelation 12 verse 9 it says that Satan is deceiving the whole world and what a job he is doing. Yes indeed. Now then Revelation 13, here is the coming one world organization of nations. And the beast, the one who is going to be, claim, be proclaimed God in the flesh to save the world. And he's going to do spectacular things. Like Jesus said, signs. And wonders. And then there's the false prophet, second half of Revelation 13, who calls fire down from heaven, tells everyone to make an image for the beast, and everyone's going to worship the beast. And if they don't worship the beast, they'll be executed because he's God, manifested in the flesh. And we will see what he will do. So John saw the whole development of this great end time, one world government, one world religion, right here in Revelation 13. Verse 1, And I, that is John, stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. You can go to Revelation 17, and that's Babylon the Great, and the great mother harlot rides the beast. And it says that God put it in their minds to fight against Christ. So let's go on right here. Seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and his feet like the feet of, the, of a bear, and it, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now how is that going to come about in such a great and fantastic way? Well, we can speculate on a lot of different things, but let's read on here just a little bit and let's do a little analysis of what may happen. And I saw one of his heads as it were slain to death but his deadly wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast having him come back to life because the false prophet probably prayed for him and he came back to life. And everyone would say, this is of God. This is of God. Look at this. Everyone get together. Yes, 
This is great. We're finally going to save the world. So they think. And they worship the dragon who gave its authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Never been anyone like this. It's got to be God manifested in the flesh. Who has the power to make war against him? Now think about that for a minute. So let me ring the bell. They have in CERN, Switzerland, the Hadrian Collider, which is dedicated to Yeshiva, the Indian goddess of destruction. And they keep hoping that they're going to find something very secret and very powerful, never before discovered. Could it be that they will find a source of power unknown before that's going to give the beast the ability to say, no one can make war against me. Now think on that. Now continuing in verse 5. And he mouth speaking great things and blasphemies was given to him, and authority was given to him to continue for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. And he was given power to make war against the saints, because those, the saints, are the only ones that will not join this great euphoric, satanic movement proclaiming that the beast is God manifested in the flesh and he's bringing peace and no one can make war against him. And to overcome them, and he was given authority over every tribe and language and nation and all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Let's see what this man is going to do. Let's see how it's going to take place. Let's see how awesome this is going to be. And remember, remember, the temple has been built. The temple, so-called, of God by the Jews. And at first, when he first comes on the scene, he makes that league with the Jews, and they get protection to finish building the temple, and the temple is up and running, and then there is that deadly wound that takes place. But it's healed. And what does he do then? Let's see it right here. Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. Verse 3. Do not let anyone deceive you by any means, because that day will not come unless the apostasy shall come first. What is the great apostasy? That great apostasy is the whole world worshiping the beast. No apostasy has ever occurred like that one's going to be. And the man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Great, fantastic power and charisma, and Satan possession to deceive the whole world. Or that is an object of worship so that he comes into the temple of God. 
same Greek words as Revelation 11, where John was told to measure the temple. Comes into the temple of God and sits down as God, proclaiming himself that he is God and verified by the false prophet. Verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness, that ties right in with Revelation 17, is already working. Only there is one who is restraining at the present time until it arises out of the midst, out of the midst of the Babylonian system. Who is that who's restraining it? Christ. Because everything's going to be done on schedule according to God's schedule, see? Not according to any figment of the imagination of men. Now here's why we know that it's going to take place at the end. And this is why John wrote in Matthew 24, the one who reads, let him understand. So read this. Lawless one shall be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth and will destroy with the brightness of his coming. A spectacular event. Even the one who's coming is according to the inner workings of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. A little sidebar. How much do we love the truth? That's something we all need to examine ourselves and ask. What are you going to do when the enforcement of the mark of the beast comes? What are you going to do when the worship of the beast comes and you won't make an idol and you won't bow down to it? What are you going to do? Because you see, at that time, the martyrdom of the saints occurs. Do we love the truth? Now notice verse 11, for this cause, God shall send upon them a powerful deception that will cause them to believe the lie that the beast is God in the flesh, the Christ. Now an interesting sidebar. I saw a report where a man was interviewing a Jewish religious figure and they were talking about Jerusalem and about the Messiah because they're looking for the Messiah to come when they build the temple. And Yes, it was Morgan Freeman in his series on In Searching for God. And he asked him, is the Messiah going to be a man or God? And the Jew answered, a man. So that's where the deception comes in with Daniel, the ninth chapter. Okay, now let's come back here to the to Revelation. Book of Revelation. Now then, let's see some of the things that God is going to do. Remember, God does nothing unless there's a warning first. So in Revelation 14, here is a great warning from God to the whole world. No one's going to miss this. No one's going to say that God never told them. And this is going to happen just before 
we come back and look at some of the events in Revelation 6 and then on in on those things for the return of Jesus Christ and what's going to happen is pictured by this feast of trumpets. Verse 6, Revelation 14. Now remember, not everything is in chronological sequence. And remember that God always gives a warning before the event occurs. What good does it do to give a warning after the event has already happened? Now, that would be utterly stupid. It's like this. If someone says, you better be careful, your tire is low, you better get it checked out. Well, you go get it checked out, right? But what if he comes along, you already had the flat tire, and, and he says, you better get your tire checked out before it gets flat. But it's already flat. See? <laughs> the warning isn't worth anything. Verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and language and people. No one's going to have an excuse saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Isn't it interesting? There are three angels. In the mouth of what? Two or three witnesses. Everything is established, right? Right? So this makes a complete warning. We just read the first one. Let's read number two. Then another angel followed saying, The great city Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because the wine of the wrath of her fornication, which she has uh, given all nations to drink. And a third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and shall be tormented in fire and brimstone in the sight of the holy angels and of the Lamb. All right. When will that event occur? Okay. This warning is given before the beast goes into the temple. And it is given before the events given in Revelation 6. So let's go back there and let's just review that and bring us up to date as we move forward. And then we will see what is going to happen. Okay. Now we know this from Revelation 5. Nothing in the final events of these major prophecies as described in the book of Revelation are going to transpire unless the order comes from God to Christ to open the seal. That should be clear. Verse 1, And I looked when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard a, one of the four living creatures say, like the sound of thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, there was a white horse, and the one sitting on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The final gathering of all the religions in the world to the one world religion to worship the beast. Doesn't it say in Revelation 13 that the whole world's going to worship the beast and the dragon? Yes, indeed. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the sound of the living creature say, Come and see. And another horse went out that was red, and power was given to him 
who was sitting on it to take peace from the earth. That's the beginning of the tribulation. When does the tribulation begin? When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. The one who has, who reads, let him understand. So that takes place here. He goes into the temple. He's proclaimed God. The wound takes place. He is revived. He comes back. And the tribulation goes in full fury. That's the second seal. Now remember, we have covered the tribulation against Israel is two years. The whole tribulation against the whole world is three and a half. And we'll see how God intervenes with that. And then the third seal, a black horse and a balance, and rationing of food, verse 6, open the fourth seal, come and see, and there was a pale horse, the name of the one sitting on it was Death, and the grave followed him, and authority was given to to them over one-fourth of the earth. Now, which fourth of that? We don't know. But it's going to be. To kill with the sword, with famine, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Fifth seal was open. Here's the martyrdom of the saints. All of those who refuse to worship the beast. All of those who refuse to make an image. All of those who refuse to have the mark of the beast. All of them. So what happens then? Then they think they've got all of those people who will not fit into this system. They are executed. They are eliminated. And they think, well, then we'll bring peace after that. Nope. Not going to happen. Because the next thing is going to be the most spectacular thing that has happened in all the sequence of these events and is next to the most important one of the resurrection. Now, let's come here to Isaiah, Isaiah 64. Here's a prophecy of it. Remember what Jesus said concerning the sign of the Son of Man, that the sign of the Son of Man would be like the sun that shines from the east to the west. Okay? So when this next seal is open, we're going to see it's going to expose the sign of the Son of Man, which looks like a second sun. But here's a prophecy of it. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. And when the melting fire burns, the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things which we did not look for, when you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. Well, that doesn't give us the time frame because the sign of the Son of Man appears, come back to Revelation 6. And verse 12, the sixth seal. And when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as the hair of sackcloth, and the moon came, became blood, and the stars fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its untimely figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the heavens departed like a scroll, ran right open, and bam, here appears the sign of the Son of Man. And look what they do. This is going to be startling. Okay. Then the heavens departed like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and every island moved out of its place. That's an earthquake. We find there are four 
occasions of calling earthquakes, and here's an earthquake that is not caused an earth, called an earthquake. Okay, let's go on. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the powerful men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, who has the power to stand. Amazing what this is going to be. Now we have some prophecies of this. Let's come back to the book of Isaiah. Let's come to Isaiah 13. Let's see what God tells us with these things. Isaiah 13. And how God is going to do to this earth what has never been done before. And remember Jesus said, a time of tribulation and trouble such as not has been from the beginning of the creation. So we need to think about those things in the terms that God says. Revelation 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw, lift up a banner on the high mountain, exalt a voice to them, wave the, the hand so that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my holy ones. They have also called my mighty ones for my anger, even those who rejoice in my triumph. And of course, that's us. The sound of a multitude in the mountains, as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of kingdoms, of nations, gathered together, the Lord of hosts gathers an army for the battle. Now, we'll see that in Revelation 8. What a thing that's going to be. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole earth. Look, brethren, we're going to have to understand. We are going to inherit an earth that we're going to have to be, be building it from the absolute ruinous ways of the wars and battles of men and God. It's going to be something. Notice, verse 6, Howl, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore all hands shall be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. They shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take a hold of them. They shall be in pain like a woman who travails. They shall be amazed at one another and their faces like blazing fire. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to make the earth a desolation. And he shall destroy the sinners out of it, for the stars of the heavens, their constellation shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in its going forth, the moon shall not reflect its light, and I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and lay low the haughtiness of the tyrants, and I will make man more scarce than gold, even the fine gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth. The earth shall move out of its place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. I'll come over here to chapter 24. This is quite a thing. So this tells us what a fantastic thing we're going to face when we come back from the sea of glass. All right. Isaiah 24, verse 1. Behold the day, behold, the Lord makes the earth empty, makes it waste. 
turns it upside down and scatters its inhabitants. Now stop and think for just a minute. With all of this going on, you know for sure that only God knows the moment of day of Pentecost when it will come because everything's all out of whack. No man can know it, only God. And here's why, because all these things take place. And as it is with the people, so shall it be with the priest, as with the slave, so with the master, as with the handmaid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be completely empty, laid waste, utterly stripped, for the Lord has spoken this word. Now, if you want to know what that will look like, watch a documentary sometime after the days of Hitler. And that's precisely what Germany was like. The earth mourns and languishes. The earth withers and languishes. The proud people of the earth wither. The earth is defiled under its people because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and have broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse, the result of all these sins, collectively all pile up for this day of destruction. And those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the people of the earth are burned and few men left. No one's going to escape because God had Jeremiah take the cup of his wrath in prophecy to all the nations of the world. So let's read that in chapter 25. Now this is against Babylon, and Babylon the Great encompasses the whole world, okay? Verse 13, and I will bring on that land all my words which I have spoken against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all nations, and many nations and great kings shall make slaves of them, that is, the children of Israel and the Jews, and I will repay them for their deeds, and according to the works of their own hands. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel to me, take the wine cup of this wrath at my hand, and cause all nations to whom I send shall send you to drink of it, and they shall drink and reel to and fro and be crazed because of the word that I will send among them. Then I took the Lord's cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink of them whom the Lord sent me to. Now, then it lists many of the nations there, but come down here to verse 26. And this tells us to all the earth. So brethren, this day of the Feast of Trumpets pictures some of the most fantastic events to occur from the beginning of creation until the return of Christ. Verse 26, all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of of the earth. Now, doesn't that sound very inclusive to you? Yes, indeed. And the king of Shishank, who is the beast, shall drink after them. Therefore you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink and be drunk and vomit. Now, this is probably part of the message that will be given by the two witnesses and fall and rise no more because of the sword that I will send among you. And it shall come to pass, if they refuse to take the cup at your hand to drink, 
Then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, You shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And that starts with the beast going into the temple and saying he's God. And shall you be unpunished? You shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth says the Lord of hosts. Prophesy against all, against them all these words and say to them, the Lord shall roar from on high the return of Christ and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar over his dwelling place and shall give a shout like those who tread out the grapes against all the people of the earth. Now, a little sidebar. Stop and think how shell shocked and how absolutely terrified that any who survive are going to be. And our first job will be to heal them. Verse 31 A noise shall come from the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. Now, all, 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 all. That's inclusive. And he will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be stirred up from the farthest corners of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. They shall not be mourned, nor gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Howl, you shepherds, and cry, and wail yourselves, wallow yourselves in ashes, you lords of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and your scatterings are fulfilled and you shall fall like a choice cedar. All right. Now, let's go ahead and take a little break and we'll come back and pick it up in the book of Revelation again.